hello, and welcome to another wonderful episode of Submitted for Your Approval, the weekly show where we talk about uh, submissions to the collective card game where a uh, community can submit cards. Uh, we're going to talk both about cards that have already been accepted last week and cards that might get in this week. I'm joined, as always, by my faithful co-host, Grief. Howdy, folks. And today we have a guest with us. Uh, normally, we try to get like a competitive player or an alpha player. We decided we'd mix it up this week a little bit. And we have Mystic Squire joining us today. He is the realm admin for Osagarth, the pirate crab fish realm, the, the realm of the high seas. And he's also pretty active in the community doing some uh, stuff like the, uh, uh, the off affinity tourney. And he organizes some of the, the jank fun tournaments. Hi. <laughs> yeah. And it's cool because we're actually going to be talking about a couple of cigar cards today, I think. Um, so first one up, we're going to talk about a couple submissions that have already made it in. And we're going to start with uh, X Marks the Spot, which is a zero drop neutral legend from Osigarth with N8. And once you play 13 unique cards, draw an extra card each turn. So this is really interesting and is, is basically going in the vein that a lot of players have been trying to design it is a Highlander design, which basically means you're trying to run exactly one copy of each card you run. Obviously, you're not going to want to run multiple copies of this, but it's trying to encourage you to run as many different cards as possible, making a deck that's more high variance and still has access to all the tools it needs, ideally. Grace, what do you think about this card? Um, it's definitely a little bit more in the direction of Highlander compared to Aragos. I think you can run multiple of it because it is an effect that can stack. And I think, I don't know if the bug is already fixed, um, if you're playing more than just 13, car uh, 13 unique cards and every time you play, uh, play it another unique card, you do another card extra. So yeah. you could actually stack multiple times just of, of, of one card which is weird, um, but that aside, I think it's perfectly fine for those who try to explore this direction of um, singleton decks. On the other hand, you could build a perfectly fine deck around this, um, even in a completely normal deck, since it's just 13 unique cards you need to hit, sure. Uh, for some decks it's hard for, and for others, but even if you're playing a play set of all cards, so three offs, except for that, um, you're playing with at least 15 to 16 with this card, uh, unique cards already. Yeah. Uh, one thing to note about this, I think that's interesting, is that, uh, especially in, with the next season that's coming up, we're going to lose draft. Draft was a great place to grab like a random extra card to maybe fill this out. And that's going away now. So if you want to complete this and you're not running Highlander, you might be encouraged to run cards that like produce tokens in hand, like Plasma Splish or something like that, just to get those names. And so it is a build around. It, I mean, if you want to use this optimally, you have to think on your feet. And I like that. But like Fire's Matchstick and um, Plasma Splish are great because they let you get two names for the price of one. Uh, the bigger cards we're going to talk about later today also another good option. Um, there's Probably more in the direction of Night Shift Merchant. Or oh, Night Shift Merchant's a great option with this, actually. Yeah, because that's five names on one card. Or Flips Burgers, if you're looking for something that can slot in any deck. Uh, so that's cool. There's a lot of awesome ways to do this. What do you think of this uh, design, Mystic? It's for your realm. Um, well, I love it for three reasons. It's my realm. It's Highlander support, and it's a quest. So... Um, my main concern about this is by time that it actually gets activated, um, game 13 cards, you'll probably get that around turn 8 maybe. But by then you have plenty of resources at your, uh, your fingertips like Atlas Globe or Meticulous Research. And I don't think it's, it's going to see much play simply because drawing an extra card that late into the game um, you're really just going to be looking for a finisher at that point, and uh, it'd really only be useful if you don't already have a finisher in hand. Hmm. That's an interesting assessment, I think. But yeah, I, I'm always excited to see more of these legends, because they give you these really interesting, like, build-arounds, and singletons already a fun enough requirement. 
Let's talk about a great card that synergizes with that. Plasma Splish. I just talked about this card already. Plasma Splish is a one drop mind action from nowhere in particular with deal one damage and create a Plasma Splash. What is Plasma Splash? It existed before. It is a one drop mind action with deal one damage to a unit and its owner. So, this is a design by Lord Davenport, who's a newer player, so congrats. And this gives you a way to get a bunch of cheap damage going in probably Ash Gertie gets the most value out of this. Um, this is great because, well, it's more one HP hate, which I don't really like, but whatever, it's in the game now. Uh, I can't do anything about it. Um, but this also kills the pan cat. So if you get pan cat, you can kill their pan cat back, which is great. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. It's an interesting simple card, and I like interesting simple cards. What do you think about this, Grief? Oh, it's actually quite simple in that case. It gives you it gives you basically range for two uh, for two HP. Gets uh, multiple one H uh, one HP units and can be uh, also played as self pink synergies. Sure, it's probably uh, its main home would be probably Ash Gertie, but I could also see it as the occasional siding instead of um, Pan Cat for uh, for uh, Victory to play this one instead because it's two copies and you're not uh, and you're not running into the old spot with um, of where the mirror where Rick could actually shoot down your own Pan Cat. Mm -hmm. Problem though is Plasma Splash needs a target. Yeah. And that target has to be a unit. So that's probably going to be one you save for later. I like what you were saying about the, uh, the, the rage or the self ping, possibly getting some extra value out of this. Because you're totally right. That does, it's great to maybe do a rage proc off of this half and then do, uh, or do maybe an enemy proc off this and then maybe a rage or a self damage proc off that or, or the other way around, whatever, what have you. Um, so yeah, it's got a lot of versatility for a simple card. Do you have anything else to say about it, Mystic? Or? Um, not really. Covered the rage thing. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty. It's simple. Yeah, but those designs are important to have in the game, and that's something Nick's kind of stressed from the beginning is he wanted to make sure we have simple commons to be more welcoming to new players trying to get into the game. And I think this is a great step in the direction. So congrats, Lord Davenport. We're just kind of blazing through these today. Uh, Got to get to the meat of the show, which is always going to be the new submissions. Uh, Gold Mace Hydra. It is a four drop strength, four, four Hydra from Talira with overrun, rage, ready this, and active. Pay one to give this plus two, plus two. Ouch. So Throne Princess Ellis has a thing that whenever you activate an active, deal one damage and ready the thing or something. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this, that's why it's Gold Mace is designed to synergize with Ellis, who is off camera right here. And they're eating a pile of be dung. And <laughs> I don't know, it's cute. I like I love the art. J Ted did a great, great job on art. Um so you should be all over this great if this is a self ping, self damage type card, right? I mean, it's Mystic Squires pick, so he should probably say something else. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's, have Mystic, let's have Mystic go first this time. Um, so, the reason why I brought this card is because, to me personally, it's a really bizarre card. You have this active um, that synergizes great with Ellis, but what really confuses me is the Rage Ready this. I'm not really sure uh, like why is that on there? Um, is there like some active self ping synergy somewhere that I'm not seeing? Or like, um, on the other hand, this can get really big. And if you can give it duelist, it's now a free suicide mission of sorts. And you can just board wipe. So I just thought the rage was really weird, though. I wasn't really sure why that's there. I think it's interesting. Um, and of course, this is something we already have to deal with. So it's a good build around. And, and it's it's something interesting for Rage decks. It's still, the thing I don't like, and I kind of see where, where you're going with this, is like you have the Rage ready this, but you don't actually get the effect that you need off the Rage most of the time. You're, you're trying to get this plus two, plus two, and then you have to go through an additional hoop of paying one to get it. 
And I think that convolutes the design a little bit. Um, but for people who just want to get their unit ready, that's maybe a way to do it. Um, Grief, do you have anything to say about it? Quite honestly, um, if you're playing this in KM, it's alongside with the, what's it called, the tank? Um, a chari uh, chariot? The ch chariot, yeah. And give this thing dualist because mm -hmm. it's a red unit. And just as a Mystic Swire already said, oh yeah, I'll ping you down. I get HP from the chariot. I'll attack you. I get HP from the chariot. I'll attack you. I get HP from the chariot. You don't really care about the plus one, plus one. For one sake, that's a bigger topic because I know that uh, JTAG wants Tell Lira to have this unique active deck, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's really bad. <laughs> You're, yeah, you, you basically you're basically just pumping it because you don't have anything better to do, especially in the board uh, board stall, and occasionally attack with it because it has overrun. Why shouldn't you? Um, but then again, you're playing this probably in a self ping esque deck, which is the which the only um, trigger for it is in Legacy, which is I think. Blaze of Elements, or how it's called. The card that looks like a Schlorp. Um, Blaze of Art Dawn. Voice, Blaze of Dawn, um, which readies this before combat, after deal, uh, after pinging it, or pinging it before, and now it can mo uh, multiply its actives, and since you're just pinging yourself for one, you can grow um, you can grow larger than, your, uh, than the damage you're receiving. Yeah. And just hit for, like, 100, uh, 100 damage to face because you're just stalling out at that point. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a weird card. I don't really get why it has to be overloaded with three different um, abilities that don't really technically do something with each other together ju or just rely on cheap interactions like the Duelist Abuse or Blaze of Dawn. Yeah. It's like it almost wants to lose that active just so you don't misclick the Duelist. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's interesting to note. Um, it is a little all over the place. So let's get to the meat of the show, which is always going to be the accepted submissions. That's what we're about. I switched to dark mode at, uh, I think it was Waka who suggested I do that. Um, here Definitely we more pleasant to the eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't actually know there was a dark mode. Uh, so that's bad on me. Um, <laughs> Stalking Shadow Wolf is a 7-drop strength 6-5 wolf from Woolly Land with untargetable, and whenever a friendly unit kills a unit, it gets plus 2, plus 2. Active, choose up to 2 units to duel with. This loses untargetable in this ability. So the first three cards we're going to talk about are for the, uh, what did they call it? They called it the 7-plus cost units card jam. I call it the finishers jam. So there are a lot of archetypes, uh, or a lot of affinities that are kind of lackluster in the number of higher cost uh, options they have. They're usually stuck with like one or two avenues. Uh, like basically, I hear that basically every spirit deck runs some combination of like Mom or Gashlorp, right? And then we need some more diversity, I think, in the end game. And so that's why the Archetype Completionist decided to go do this. I think it's a really noble effort. Um, so this card... This is designed specifically to actually ramp into a different finisher in Wolf Amalgam and kind of fill out actually the mid game for like a Proma control, I think would be the, who runs Wolves? Usually Proma? Yep. Uh, Proma control. Uh, kind I think of, it's usually uh, Wolf and Vox and Proma. Yeah, they do mm -hmm. the Wolf and the Vox combo or whatever, or combination. Um, so it's like a bigger uh, stock pack Pouncer, the 3-5? Yeah, no, yeah, the 3-5, yeah, the that's the Sharp Fang Stalker. No, Sharp Fang Stalker, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they have a lot of similar names uh, going on in Woolly Land. Because um, they only have two different uh, creature types. They got the wolf. Well, I guess they got the one dog. So, this is Make Your Duelist More Survivable, which is really, really always going to be dangerous. Um, in Pearl Mall, what you actually want to probably run this with is Dan. With Dan, this is nuts. 
because you get your you get your guy out, you get your Dan out, and you start hitting as hard and fast as you can with the astronaut squad, and then you're gonna be gaining like crazy amounts of plus two plus two buffs, and that could be a hard lock. Um, you have any other thoughts on this grief? I probably wouldn't play it with Dan, but that's another topic because um, if I'm already so hard in the uh, in the wolf pack thing, because this is a moon howler with a stalk pack, uh, with a stalk pack, not with a shard chain treatment, and you're probably seldom dueling stuff with uh, unless you're using it as a hard removal. And mm -hmm. still, if it kills units, it gets plus four, plus four of the uh, double duelists. Of course, it, it loses uh, on target of all, but mm -hmm. not just it just kill a um, x three HP or uh, sorry um, three x um, unit and pff, who cares? You just gain one uh, you just gain one HP more out of the whole the whole deal, and it triggers your wolf amalgamation uh, definitely faster. The thing is, though, outside of duelists, etc. You could basically end the game with this alone and don't have to go on to the Wolf of Migration because in a more aggressive and a more aggressive deck, this is the uh, this is probably your end game. And you're the only card you're still dropping is probably Argos at some point, just for an extra bit of damage. Um, because every little attack that basically kills stuff on the board of your opponent just grows larger. It's it probably fits into any kind of um, equipment strategy as well. Bees and um, blazing shurikens, lightning rapier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of really scary stuff you can do with it. By the way, I just want to say real quick, I eat candles. You did great on the art here. It is really, really pretty. It is super spooky. I, I like this. How is this doing? This is doing nine. Uh, votes have been weird. We've been seeing a lot of really high, really, really low things. I think this could probably use a bump. I, I like this card a lot. Uh, this would actually get me to figure out how the wolf deck works um, just to run this guy. Um, and, I, of course, I would I would throw a Dan in there even though it doesn't belong. Mystic, what's your thoughts? Um, so something interesting because I do the Incursion Boss every week. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. shameless self-plug. <laughs> um, I do the Incursion Boss for the card gems every week. The AI does not know how to use the active. But that brings up the interesting question. If we completely ignore the active, this is just an untargetable with mm -hmm. whenever a friendly unit kills a unit, it gets plus two, plus two. Mm -hmm. Now, if we actually go back to Gold Mace for a moment, these two actually synergize really well together if you have duelists or oh. pretty much yes. anything. This is just now giving all your units like plus two, plus two. Because we is talked insane. about how the problem, yeah, the problem with the gold maze high trim was that this gets around that. That is like just completely ignoring the active. This is actually really good. Yeah. And I guess if you wanted to, if you wanted to run like, let's do the classic Stranger Jank deck. If you wanted to run this in Penumbra, uh, Strength, Spirit, Chroma, or something. You could also run this the soul twine combo and get <laughs> get that uh, active to trigger or the passive to trigger three times per kill. That'd be fun with the triplicate uh, soul twine thing. Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> uh, okay, good. Um, sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. No, no, but yeah, um, Squire as well did some untargetable moon howler. Yeah. So this get both on the field. It's plus three, plus yeah. two. So this was Grief's pick for the, for the jam, and this needs no help from us. <laughs> but, but let's talk about it. It's interesting. It's genuinely a very interesting card. Standing tall at 41 votes, we have the King of Tall Tales. It is a 10-drop mind 7-5 Nightling from Sweatlo. Sweatlo's second legendary. It has Summon. Replace this card's text with all other non-summon abilities in play permanently, then silence, then exhaust all other units. This is scary. Uh, Wham, by the way, Wham, who was kind of first and foremost on this design, insists that this is less scary than Geschlorp. 
My problem is if you are, you can't build around Geschlorp. Geschlorp is just there to be a one-sided board clear. This thing you can build around. Of course, you do got to pray that your opponent isn't running stuff like places, which could convolute it. You can't, you can't bank on attacking with this guy is the tricky part. But if you are clever, I am sure somewhere out there, there's a bonkers combo going on with this card. What do you think, Grief? I love this card because it, for all it does is basically a iconoclasm on a stick, and you really don't want to. Uh, you don't really care about what combos you can either run with it. Um, you can actually use it as a build around. You can use it as a big iconoclasm on a stick. Um, you can basically uh, utilize it for other reasons, which we're going into uh, just next. Um, but most important part about it is you can also. Um, Get, uh, you can also set up certain um, graveyard interactions with Entomb active synergies, which yep. is the more important part about it. <laughs> um, because we're getting the new hero, Marie, God, that hero is good. And she has a level 3 that basically allows you to, for one mana, a hero active, banish the top card of your graveyard and activate all its actives and entomb and summon abilities. You can build a shutter walk out of this dude. Yeah. That f eats all your uh, that eats all the damn entomb effects from your units. Pitch you into the graveyard. Even if you uh, even if you absorb stuff like can't attack or bullshit like that. Yeah. Um you can even absorb the positive uh effects from your places and put him on himself. You can basically try to um get Ronan on him to flicker this dude. You could also merge those soul twine combos you've uh, mentioned. Um also certain uh unit inter uh, certain unit combos can be basically interact with him that you cannot build on your deck alone because Certain decks cannot run sp uh, uh, can uh, not, uh, cannot run certain e uh, exclusive cards, but your opponent can. And against that, <laughs> what are you getting? Probably a mom. Maybe steal the effect of one of the uh, maybe steal the effect of the growl forest. Mm -hmm. What happens if they have an untargeted pride right on the field? <laughs> they <laughs> So yeah, this card can actually do so much fun uh, fun stuff. And at 10 cost, it's rather, it's rather fair. You basically have a giant ability sponge on the field that can do everything and nothing. <laughs> what I think is interesting about this is it's a comp... It, it, you could use this, like you said, as an iconoclasm, but the way I think of it is a combo card. But it's also a combo card that counters almost all the other combos in the game. Like, a lot of people have been talking about the massive many combo with Baleful Pumpkinkin and Sweet Ascent Kodama. If that's out and you drop this, I'm now running your combo deck. <laughs> it's scary and it's beautiful. What do you think of this, Mystic? Um, well, it's it's definitely scary. Um, something that I've been thinking about is anything like with Agile, if anything has Agile on the board, uh, Burn probably has better finishers than what this could be, but like since Burn usually has a ton of Agile cards, you put this on the board, it now has Agile, all the other units are exhausted, it can now just hit 7 for face. Unless there's a can attacker out, yeah. Yeah, or there's um, the real thing that's scary about this is if they slurp your board, um, you can actually just drop this. Now, all the Entombs are in one. And assuming you can protect it somehow, if there was another untargetable unit or something, um, yeah, this is now just, haha, you could you control up my board, your finisher is now worthless. Yeah, if you can protect it. I agree. Yeah, this is interesting. Definitely. I mean, go up for those if you haven't already, if you're one of the two players that didn't upvote it. Um, I guess it's not standing at perfect upvotes, so some people are, are so scared of this, they're not upvoting uh, it. I don't blame them, but I'm gonna... I'm all for... It's such a fun card. It's such a... It's gonna be fun. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's Timmy. Oh. It's like a 
a Timmy mm, combo card? N no. Okay, Timmy combos probably, but at that point, um, sure. I rather want to drop this against an effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, <laughs> the point of this jam was to put was to diversify the finisher game. I can't tell you if I'd rather see Nefet or this. I can tell you. I don't know. Well, my real issue is that is that kind of counters other finishers as well. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's what that's really scares thing. me. That's that's personally something for me that I like because our finishers have been so me for the longest time, to be honest. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, move on to Horrific Whispers. It is a seven drop spirit, zero, zero. We'll see about that in a minute. Undead Spectre Horror from nowhere in particular with Agile, Regenerate, even stranger. How does, it, how does this thing work? Summon, players discard their hands and draw three cards. This unit's attack and HP are equal to the number of units in your graveyard. Ow, I'm just reading this. Okay, so this was designed before people knew Marine was a thing. Uh, Shadow Knight, wow. Shadow Knight knocked the art out of the park on this one. He is getting better. I like it. Um, this is Shadow Knight and Shadow Knight. It's only standing at three and it's standing at four. Um, okay, so Marine. Discard their hands. I want I want lots of stuff in my graveyard. I'm already going to have a bunch of units because Marie is going to try and be as action light as possible. And I get this big, scary, agile thing that just grows and grows and grows and grows. Neat. This is definitely a great tool for Marie. I could also see Dat, uh, maybe Dat Control running it. Who does self-mill the most? Baluk or Dat? Um... Depends on your shell, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> probably, the, and if you really want, want to add who on a Grave Sword stack where you build yourself, it's probably that. Yeah, and it is worth noting that this is an undead. So stuff like Rosa um, could potentially maybe get something interesting out of this. I'm not sure. Um, Rosa can do a lot of interesting stuff. Mystic, what, your, what are your thoughts about it uh, on this card? Because you picked it. Oh, yeah. Um, it it's kind of, it's really weird because it's like, it feels really like clunky to use. I'm not really sure how to like use this properly, but like if you can actually pull off, um, it can actually be really insane. If you have a lot of token spawner, you can get this to like 20, 20 easily. Yeah, but I really like this too. Actually, in something like uh, Fog Spam, if you're running Fog, you could drop this and you might be able to just win the game when they're at 25 HP because of how much damage this does. And this discards like their entire hand, so it gets rid of their entire hand. It's, but then it also has like regenerate. It just feels like all over the place, but also like really powerful and really weak at the same time. I'm not really sure how to feel about this one in particular. Um, most and uh, the most annoying part it would be actually to drop this card. Uh, um, this card actually has a quite nifty home outside of just the Brave Source bullshit. Um, think of Dralox. Have you ever uh, have you re have you forgotten what rooftop sniper does? Rooftop sniper says deal two damage to your opponent, and when you dis uh, when you discard a card and return the card back to their hand. This card says your opponent discards the entire hand. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that does add another interesting level of counterplay because now in the mirror. Or if you're Marie versus Marie in the in the upcoming season, you this has interesting counterplay if you see what I mean. What are your yeah, you can you can also steal the you can also steal your opponent's uh, graveyard with Journey to the Dead with yeah. this card. Now you have an you now you have an hyperfilled um, graveyard and drop a thirty thirty plus regenerate agile unit as long as they don't have a as long as they don't have a beat stick on uh, or an 
sorry, a strong blocker on board, they cannot really do, uh, do anything against that. And it basically removes most answers they have in their hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I dropped this down in a pinch. I think, honestly, Baluk wants the most. Here's why. Well, we don't know what the thing's going to look like after the rework, but let's assume it's similar. Uh, the Strife, getting a bunch of cheap tokens. Those cheap tokens are born to die, and so it fills up your graveyard more. Undead is already going to try and run some things in the, in the self-mill kit. And then, like you said, you can also, if you want to make this really big, go, go big or go home, slap down a journey on it and make it even bigger. And Baluk is an aggro deck. He tends to run out of gas. This gives you stuff back because that draw three is going to probably be a lot more to you than it does to a control player. Um, so that's really neat. I like it. I do think mm. it needs overrun or something because like at seven... Please no. Please no. <laughs> at that point it actually ends games and at that point it may actually be a little bit too overpowered. Sure, it is an instant attacker, so if they don't have an uh, blocker or an ambusher or whatever, or even a hard removal to deal with this, um, this can easily hit for 15 plus damage directly to face, so. <laughs> well, on top of that, if they decide to board wipe, you now have yes. free reign to just play this and essentially win the game. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, now let's move away from the finisher's jam and talk about the other submissions. Starting with my picks and my favorite little guy, my best little guy, the Neon Echo. It is a two-drop mind, one-one bat from Aesthetica with flying and entrance, create a Neon Wisp. What is that, pray tell? It is a one-one one drop mind, one-one with entrance, this attacks. So, last week, the week before last week, I think, maybe? We got Anuguin Sharpshooter, something I've been wanting in the game for a long time. Probably my favorite design that Anoid's ever done. That says, whenever you play a unit, deal one damage to your opponent. So yes, you're running it off Affinity, but that is a cool tool for Ash Gertie if she wants to do something aggressive with tokens. Um, play, not enters play. Oh, well, you still, okay. <laughs> God, oh man. We gotta update that. Okay, so you still get it off the Echo. And you still get an attacker off the Echo. And so it doesn't work as well in the Neons as I thought. And I'm totally bummed out on this card now. I'm gonna leave my, oh yeah, it's not doing so hot. It, it gets one, one little upvote from me. Um, what is this still good for? It's a flyer, it's got an entrance. You can copy that and get a bunch of these little guys. I guess they're forced to attack. But this could fill in Ash Kirby's kit pretty well. Or Grief's going to go disagree with me now. Go Grief. Uh, I, I want to hear Mystic Square first, because I'm okay. prone to basically pick and take all the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let's see, yeah, let's not have, have Grief monopolize things. Uh, go. Um, with Neon Cupcake coming into play, uh, I could see this. You play it for three mana. You now get two procs on the on Ash Gerby. So you could probably get like three mana, easily hit your... Uh, your passive EXP gain and probably hit your level 3 really fast. So it could be used so, for some really aggressive plays if you want some quick EXP. Yeah. Coming out on turn 3 if they're not prepared for it, this could be pretty nice. And then you have that nice flyer. The art is also very pretty. Space Turtle did a good job on this. So, regarding Neon... Um, our bestest, our bestest combo boy uh, Ronan is known, and we have King of the Lost, and then there is this aggro shell that's occasionally used in uh, Ash Gertie, but overall, flinking and stuff isn't really a deck on its own yet. This actually fits into that shell, because as I mentioned, the aggro shell of Neon that is like, um, Boom, um, boom artist or boom magician, um, where you, uh, the new card that uh, banishes and or the blink stuff when it attacks, you have the twins, etc., or even um, just vanishing act can actually interact with this because all of them do stuff when they actually attack or put copies 
of the cards they're blinking at, uh, and taking into the board. So this can actually fill the board on its own if we're just putting a copy of it uh, into play. <clears throat> so you want to copy it with, uh, with, uh, with a Dune Walker Sorceress, with a uh, with the twins, with a new daredevil, I think how it's called, mm -hmm. that puts copies of a cards into play attacking. And if you do this once or twice a turn, you fill your board with at least uh, six damage worth of uh, six damage worth of tokens on the board. <clears throat> two of which attack, <laughs> uh, two of which are, are attacking flyers, and the rest are just one ones on the board uh, on the uh, on the ground, and now, uh, now slot in stuff like um, uh, uh, attack to order or the, uh, the level three of uh, Ashgardi. So those are uh, so those are even, uh, sorry those are even more lethal. Give the order. Make, yeah. Give the order. Give the order. So those are even more lethal. Um, in that case, sure, this could actually see play in some heavy aggressive self playing strategies that. Neon tried to do, but never really capitalized well on. Yeah, so this actually kind of bridges like the one attack archetype and the blank archetype, and you could run something that's kind of a hybrid there that's really neat. I don't understand why people are so scared of this. Like, I, I guess they're scared of the what this does for uh, the king combo, the Ronin thing. Um, I don't know what probably, else. probably because it brings a it brings a always brings a body with it. Well, I was thinking back to what I mentioned about Cupcake. If you play this, if you, if you play Cupcake, then this, that's three units on board. And if you play Ronin, you now just dealt nine damage to face for seven mana. Mm -hmm. And if your opponent played any additional cards, that's more damage. And then you can vanish in Hect Ronin for like 15 damage. But that's like eight mana and like four different cards. So, so yeah, but yeah, that's your finisher. And ideally, your opponent has something to disrupt bits and pieces of this. Because there's a lot of one HP hosers in this game. And you're not going to be running friendly smudge to save your, uh, your one drops. Yeah. Okie dokie then. What did I pick for my second pick? Oh, yes. This... I am crazy excited about this thing, and you guys are going to think I'm crazy again. Uh, Ring the Bell is a one-drop neutral artifact from Hope's Hollow with create two hungry beggars in hand. Those are zero-drop one-ones. Why does it make them in hand? Because they are beggars. They are trying to eat. And this procs food. This gives you double value out at least two procs off of every single food you play for free. So this is the first time we've seen clever food support that's not food itself. Um, this basically functions like emergency fire. It can be slotted in any kind of deck, including egolessness, and um, makes food really, really worthwhile, potentially. This is why you use the beefy burger menu item on a flip, because you can get really, really cheap uh, three threes, a couple of them. Um, and so I'm excited. I think Lord Davenport did great on these designs. I don't know where my voting went. That was supposed to be an upvote. And these are doing actually pretty good. I think people are getting the idea. So now here's where you tell me I'm all wrong. Uh, or no, no, no. We'll have Mystic Squire go first. Mystic Squire can, can get excited with me and then grief will tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually really happy to see some food support that's not Jill and Brad. Yeah. That's really nice. Um, have some nice food support. Uh, I don't know. I guess we could talk about Hope's Hollow. Is that a new realm? So, okay. I Seems like it. A chance to talk to Davenport about this. He wants it to be a small realm. He doesn't want it to be like a big thing. Um, I, I jokingly describe this as the two miles surrounding a nunnery. Um, <laughs> So this has this cathedral, and they're feeding these poor people, and it's like a sad medieval farming village. Uh, he did really cool with the colors and did like a, a gray, drab, dreary kind of thing. He's not planning on expanding it big, I think, yet. We'll see. Um, so back to what you are saying. Uh, it's, it's just interesting to see, like, there's so many new realms, and this one I'm actually really excited for. I thought food was like this cool concept, 
but it's just really hard to actually utilize properly because there's no like proper units that can actually pull off really easily. And I think this actually feels like a niche thing that we never knew we needed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, now what are your thoughts, Grief? Um, starting with food or feet um, as a game mechanic altogether. I like it. It's pretty underutilized, but it's badly implemented in the collection. That's the problem. Because either food is extremely costly because it does some weird uh, shenanigans. On the other hand, you're just playing just one or two units off of them, even if they're pretty cheap or recycle the same units because the feed effect is uh, uh, the feed effect lasts until the end of the turn. So you're only use, utilizing one to three feed cards altogether in your deck and only just specific ones that helped you. That's why I was always kind of confused when people bring up, oh yeah, we need more food synergy cards. Yeah, food uh, worse, have a worse synergy than places. What synergy do you want? I mean, there is no targets really for food. Those hungry beggars fill that slot because they're cheap one uh, cheap one ones for zero. They are fluffy boys, but just a little bit more Wrap. Um, and I like it because it is actually the uh, this missing glue that helps people playing a lot of food or different uh, food effects. So even a legacy now you can run food card off of it. You can run the um co- the this pig that counts different and that wants uh, different food in your graveyard because every time you play food it goes bigger or stuff like that yeah and you can utilize those tokens with it on the other hand we probably need a little bit more of those tokens or cards in that regard that allow you to put those tokens into your hand or reutilize or make cheaper your food or your food collection mm. So it's a step in the right direction. And that was one thing that Lord Davenport actually uh, had a lot of different possible ways to do this. They submitted like six of these designs Mm -hmm. that all use the beggars in in slightly different ways. And I think Davenport put a lot of thought and a lot of love into this. And so I'm really excited to see some of these designs succeed. Definitely. Okay, now let's talk about, okay, this is time for me to go with even more jank. Now this time, this time we're, we're definitely on the crazy side of things. Say hello to MC Rodamine, which is a four drop spirit 2 2 scientist who's from Tutela. Whenever this enters or leaves play, replace your other units with random ones whose base cost is one more and ready them. Grief is smiling. This is good. So. That is so broke. <laughs> it is so broken. I don't know. Like, okay, but it's random. It's random, and that's something we gotta acknowledge. But, like, I don't know what level this would be balanced at. I want to believe that it would be balanced not too much higher. There's this card called Neon Cupcake. For those of you who are asleep, Neon Cupcake, whenever you play the card, will immediately remove it and replay it. There's another card called Vanishing Act, which will do that again. (laughs) So there's at least two cards that can do that trick. If you do that once with MC Rotamine, your cards just got a lot bigger. However, there's a drawback. Because they're random units now, you're getting, you can't really, like, this is the card you're building around. You're not building around the other units in your deck. The other units are just trying to be on curve. And Tutela has this thing where you're pulling in random stuff. So you get a lot of options, but no control over what those options are. Um, Mystic Squire, we'll let you go first. Okay, so my first thought when I saw this is mischief uh monkey mischief i I don't know its name but uh mischief maker that's it um i really want that card to be a thing (laughs) i don't know why but i want this to i want to play mischief maker and i want to just give this to to my opponent and just watch them as their entire like combo because something actually actually i just realized this um this counters pride perfectly with Mischief Maker because since it's now their unit, it goes through ward and untargetable. So this is now a seven mana combo with Mischief Maker. 
uh, Pride deck or just any combo deck, you can now just board wipe it and, in a sense. And, yeah. and your Mischief Maker isn't going to be that uh, useless little monkey because this also replaces it when it leaves play. So yeah, exactly. you'll have a massive board and you ruin your opponent's board synergy. Okay. So the problem with that is they are going to get bigger. So it could end up biting you in the butt. But I see what you mean. I mean, obviously against pride, you're just going to just kill them. Also, that's true. But yeah, I think that's really clever, Mystic. What do you think, Grief? I don't know what to think of. I love this card. <laughs> um, the, you don't really care if it is a random unit, actually, because you are basically building a deck around utilizing flicker effects anyways. You can even put in, uh, put this Underlabs Enigma um, mm -hmm. glass in a joy card on it to put a copy of it into your hand that you could later utilize to either climb with your um, Rotomine, which will also then trigger off of itself because it leaves play when it is replaced. Now changing the uh, other Rotomine that is a 1-1 one -one token again into another unit because that triggers. So you're climbing just off of, two, uh, of a two card combo to more, uh, uh, two more mana costs on your entire board, which mm -hmm. is then readied. Sure, um, the random aspect hits us uh, potentially when it comes to summon units because those are terribly statted for the most part. But Everything else you don't care about because, no, forget what I said. I said you can climb with it uh, just one or two levels. You're climbing like three to four levels of just two card combos. <laughs> one interesting thing, though, that you could also do with this, my thought, is massive many. So if you get... A... On your massive many. <laughs> so if you get a couple good units off of this, you can, you know, a couple good interesting random effects, you could throw down massive many and you can get the best of both worlds, right? Yeah, you throw down mass of many and lose it because this card, or you mean the other cards that you, you wouldn't remove in this case, but if no. she gets removed, your mass of many changes. No, you take Rotamine into the mass. Yeah, and then your mass, of, uh, mass yeah. is removed because after it, uh, because you removed your board, uh, put, uh, oh, put the mass of many into the board and it. lose your mass of many. So, yeah, so what for that? <laughs> dang it. Yeah, that ain't gonna work. <sighs> She's such a weird build around card, and you can actually throw her, as a Mystic already said, uh, into Mischief Maker. Oh, oh, yeah, and by the way, if you want to play Mischief Maker, play Legacy because you're just giving them a um, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Henry the Ape. Yeah. Such a mean combo because you just need to find your mischief maker give them henry to your opponent and watch them how the entire deck turns into random bullshit yeah so that's <laughs> a thing i don't you're right it's it's a good build around its own right sadly the man uh, org you and your massive many man why because <laughs> carthian that's why okay uh, I am going to breeze right through this so everyone pay attention. The Anuguian Beastmaster is a four drop strength, two, three Lizabo from Unguia that gains plus one, plus one for each dinosaur you control. And at the start of each turn, create a random dino and ready it. Dino tokens. Two, uh, two drop, one, one flyer. A two drop, well, it does, the drop doesn't matter. Two, one, three, rage gain one attack. And a three, one overrunner. So the earlier versions of this card have this really, really jank clause that let you uh, take any effect you put on the Beastmaster and copy it over to your dinosaurs. That is gone now, and that makes me sad. But it didn't get in with that, so I understand. Grief, this is the top of your picks. Let's talk about this. Um, dinosaurs are a bad deck. Cool. This makes dinosaurs better. <laughs> Do I have to say more? Oh yeah, it gives you free value each uh, each and every turn. Um, sure, it is random, but I don't have anything against a one-one free flyer or rage attacker that can also block stuff and kill it. Or an overrun unit. I just uh, or basically uh, 
basically an overrun unit that I don't care about. I just run it into phase. And if it dies, maybe I'll just get a new one next turn. This is the Jamie of dinosaurs on the board. And I like it because it also protects itself. Um, you run this in legacy with stuff like um, Raptor or in a standard with, um, uh, with all the cheap dinosaurs and support for them. In addition to that, he's a Lazabo, so it benefits off of Lazabo synergies. You can also, which is also quite, uh, which is also quite interesting, utilize it for sacrifice decks and dancer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a lot of different things that could really be going with this. It's got that beautiful art from Fetus on it. So this this card's going to get in eventually. Question is which version? I'm a little bit sad the earlier one didn't get in, but it's whatever. Mystic, what's your thoughts? Well, I was thinking one thing they could do since the more drink version they get in is now it kind of loses a lot of its amazing flavor it had with the with the gain abilities from this card. Mm -hmm. They could just add the plus one plus one for each dino onto each of the other dinos because i feel like that was like one of the most unique things about this card is that for each one that spawns in they all get stronger together now it just kind of feels like oh it's just it's just another token spawner there we have a few token spawners already um i think this could be really fun but it's just kind of like, it's just kind of there and I don't know, it feels really bland without the, without the jank. Yeah, I, I think it's still got some stuff going for it. it it's, it's still support for dinos, still support for Lazabo. Um, but I, I do see what you mean, that it lost some of what I thought was the charm. So for once, we're not talking about the- Charm that is pretty much broken. <laughs> <laughs> For once, we're talking about the community. That. Shame on you, community. You should have voted the, the broken <laughs> version in. <laughs> we, can always we can always break or uh, nerf a busted card. We can't always fix an uh, undervalued... The know. thing is, most times when we nerf cards, we nerf them to stone. <laughs> most of the time. Back to busted cards. The chocolate-dipped card is a two-drop mind food from nowhere in particular with feed draw card. <laughs> Awesome! Like, I want... Well, first of all, I think this is probably way too powerful. Uh, there was another one that was trying this on steroids, the uh, Sewer Pot Tea. This is a toned-down version. Um, you'll notice that it's got four contributors and four words on the card. So, uh, 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 Percival joked on the Discord that each uh, contributor came up with one word. <laughs> so... I want to enjoy this card a lot because I like food. Um, and hopefully with Hope's Hollow, hopefully at least one of those card designs gets in. This is great synergy. Um, it is a little lackluster, I guess, but this could be the start of something beautiful. I don't know whether or not this is appropriate or not, though, because that's how draw power is very, very hard to balance. Do you think this is balanced, Grief? I want to hear Mystic first. <laughs> let's, let's do Mystic first. Yeah. This is balanced, Mystic. Mystic, have we lost you? I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have to say no. And the reason for this is, um, I remember there's this guy a while back. I'm not gonna get into details of that, but it was saying something like, "You always take the most powerful scenario this can be in." If I don't know if I agree with that judgment, but keep going. <laughs> well, anyways, um, my thought behind this is if for some reason you have like a lot of mana, I don't know, um, in like the original rare material jank where yeah. you could reduce it to zero, um, if you have a lot of cheap units you can spawn or play, you can now just draw like five cards. I think 
uh, this will be great for like Ash, um, Ash Gertie, where she just has a lot of aggro. She has a lot of uh, one to three units that she can just play. Um, just refill her entire hand and keep playing more. So this is like it's worth it's a dead draw early on but in the late game for aggro i'm not really sure hmm. this is just all over the place like i this is narco i just don't know how i feel about this because its power level has the potential to be like crazy like um the equipment, uh, like arms, uh, master of arms, yeah, insane draw power, but it could also just be really worthless. Yeah, it's one of those like feast or famine cards where its its power level varies wild, wildly depending on where the board's at. What do you think, grief? It's a simple but really powerful card that, in the hands of a person who is not really aiming to get the most out of it, will usually draw between two to a maximum of three cards. In King Combo, or a KM deck that plays it for zero, this can be a little bit more. <laughs> um, because you are playing cards or units that are reduced to like one to zero mana that you just recast and recast and recast again. At that point, as is basically your fuel for your engine to even find either uh, to either uh, find the finisher like Ronin or to just get you into a position where even if you're just using it as a draw engine that you cycle through your entire deck with, allows you to put you into a position that could be game winning if you're not outright winning from there. And in, uh, in the vein of KM, a more token esque KM deck, or in this case, maybe a beggar KM deck that could um, get a bunch of cheap one to two cost units, playing this on a level up. For, uh, uh, for zero, changing into her red form. Now you're playing all the cheap red units. You can also play friend cheap. At the end, you can play, um, how's it called? The chicken, the chicken tower. Chicken tower into your, um, <clears throat> into the dagger, getting the dagger off, drawing a card, drawing a chicken tower, playing the chicken tower, drawing another card, maybe getting something else to uh, trigger this off to sacrifice. Playing another card because you play uh, because you sacrifice the chicken into the uh, dagger, so on and so forth. So it is an enabler for a specific draw engine combo. Sure, as I said, it's a food card, so you can basically play it in its weakest state, usually uh, for at least two to three uh, cards that you draw off of it. But if you really want to go heavy into combo shenanigans you can get, we'll get the most out of it. So I think it's basically um, on an empty folder scale, probably on a four. It has a really high ceiling and has a lot of potential that you can tap into. Okay, now this is actually something that, so Grief has done this thing where he started finding a way to snipe out picks before I make them. Normally, <laughs> But he's gotten clever and he's gotten around this. I wanted to pick this card because I am so proud of this designer. It's a new player. Uh, just showed up like yesterday on the Discord. Uh, Arcooch. I'm not going to try and botch that. Um, created the Sea Spectre Long Neck, which is an eight drop spirit three four designer dinosaur from Unglia. With summon, return a unit from your graveyard to your hand, and this gets plus one, plus one for each unit you control. So this wants to run the long con with that, probably a bunch of big fat like control type lockout units. And for a new player, I mean, all the elements are there. You got a great name, you got a art off of the free art sheet, really awesome piece by JTAD. I think it's pretty balanced and it's also a neat build around. Um, so I was very, very excited to talk about this card. Um, 
So you could run this in Baluk really well if you get like a swarm of a bunch of tokens or whatever. Or if you're Dat and you've got a couple like bastions of sticky stuff out, <laughs> that's also going to help. And I don't know if the cost is quite right, but I think I think this is a good card. This is this is interesting. And you also get the free res out of it. So well, not res, but you get it back to your hand. So recursion. It's it's a neat little package. Uh, what do you think, Mystic? So something that bugs me is there's Spectre in the name, but there's no Spectre in the tribes. Yeah. <laughs> if this gets in, I'm going to send cosmetic update. Like, Definitely. I wanted to point that out as well. It was so funny that you mentioned that. I mentioned it to him on the, on the Discord. I think, I don't know, must have just been a minor oversight. I also said it should have been Star because that doesn't look like it's made out of water. It looks like it's made out of space. Um, but apparently that's at, least, at least give us the spectre synergies. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. And it does, yeah. <laughs> Any other um, personally, I don't think this is super useful. It's really slow. A return unit from graveyard to hand is worth about two mana. Yeah. And other than that, this is just a big, statty vanilla. It's pretty much French vanilla. Um, I think this actually could be fine costing six or seven. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little yeah. over costed, I agree. But it's yeah. a complete design for a newbie, and I really like how, how much thought got put into this. But yeah, I think it was probably being a little overly cautious. What do you think, Grief? I think there's also a comment that says that it's a little bit on the weaker side or too underpowered. We could probably scroll down. I don't remember, but that's basically what I. Yeah, this is what I think. Should should cost six. Um, yeah, shout out to Adrian. <laughs> yeah, Adrian um, called it, got on this before us. Um, yeah, this should probably cost six or get when it is eight mana more stats. I want to talk about this card for three different reasons. First of all, the Spectre. Give it a Spectre Tribe, because it has synergies with Spectre Tribe. Do it. <laughs> Second of all, it's, as I said, the stats are not really quite correct. It could either be a six drop or it can get more stats all over it, because at eight, um, the amount of tokens that you spam to that point, if you really are into the uh, token strat, you rather play Brutal and Outburst at that point, which is also eight and gives you three bodies. Sure, they are a little bit on the smaller end, but it's over on Agile dudes. Mm -hmm. um, and the third part, we're getting the re. This is a summon effect. That re that reorders or um, and that either reorders or gives you kites you want to put back on top of it later, back mm -hmm. to your hand, because this is a and this is because either if you play it. You're getting one card off of a graveyard. If it's a top card that you don't want there, you can pick it, bring it back to your hand or get a more bottommost card off your graveyard back to your hand that you can utilize. If it ever enters the graveyard, you remove it from your, uh, due to your uh, active ability and just utilize it as in uh, forgive and forget for one mana mm -hmm. out of your graveyard. That can, again, go either one card deeper in your graveyard or get another card from your graveyard back into your hand, like maybe stuff you pitch there with Memoir Wisp sooner, and now you're getting uh, now you're getting that unit back. Pitch it with Memoir Wisp on top of your graveyard, get something else back, and now you have the card that you had maybe pitched there or milled there five turns earlier. Now on top of your deck, <laughs> on top yeah. of your graveyard. So this is a really complete design, as you mentioned, and I like it. It just needs a stat adjustment. Yeah, just a couple minor tweaks, and I think this could be great. And, and like you said, you did a really great job for, for some early submissions from a new player. Um, now, this is the start of Mystic submissions. We're kind of running over time, but I, I don't really care. We don't really have any sort of – I don't think we have anything going on. Uh, friendly Scoop. This is a weird design from the king of – I do weird designs. Oscar! <laughs> The guy behind such gems as weeds, and I don't remember any of the other ones. Um, grief. Be nice, Grief. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I don't know what you're mentioning. 
Friendly Scoop is a four drop neutral three three elemental with summon. Move the text from a random unit in your deck to a friendly unit with no text. Pro I'm already getting a bunch of red flags. First of all, this is a rare on a maybe even a common uh, effect. Uh, I, that doesn't really matter, but it's just overvaluing an effect that I have little to no control over already. And I don't even think I can build around this. Like, I, I, it's a random effect. If I'm running a vanilla in my deck, it has a chance of just pulling that vanilla's text box onto my other vanilla. <laughs> and no, you have also the chance of dropping the effect from a friendly scoop onto your vanilla. Which uh, yeah. So if I'm running, if I'm running three of, I'm also running probably three of the vanilla. The chance this has of doing nothing is really high. <laughs> and doesn't copy a summon because I didn't summon the thing. So I don't know. I just see a lot of lot of potential problems with this. Um, really great art from Squawk. I just think it's it's pulling in too many different directions. Uh, what do you think, Mystic? Why did you pick this card? What was your, your motivation? Um, well, my original thought is that this has some really high jank capacity. Uh, for example, you could probably get something like Nepit in your deck. I, I was not thinking at all um, about it pulling from itself or another vanilla when I was thinking of this combo. But, but the summon could, will... Oh, Nepit is an entrance. Okay. Yeah, Nepit is an entrance. But it and still And then you could go off. link it or because it has an tome. Or just really anything like uh, really high cost, like uh, Ethera. You now have a four mana Ethera or something like that with Entome Return, and you can revive higher cost units like Nefit from your deck. I think how you'd want to run this if it got into the game is you'd have a few vanilla units, you have this, and then you'd have a bunch of really high cost units that are either actives or entrants or have really strong tomes. And you would just put really high costumes on the board for like four mana, five mana, maybe six mana or something like that. Hmm. And it just seemed really high jank potential. It's, I think it's too high rolly though. Like I'm the king of jank and I think it's, it's too high rolly. Maybe if this, I'll, I'll play. I'll play on your side, Mystic, for a bit. If this filtered so that it only pulled non-empty text boxes, that would be better, a step in the right direction. Because then maybe we can have Vanilla Matters be a thing and have this be like the finisher for Vanilla Matters. Um, maybe in like a self-silence deck, uh, you can pull some stuff onto like your friendly giant by silencing him. Uh, whatever that seven-seven giant is. I think there's maybe a couple ways to do it, but it's just a little... It's not there yet. First of all, we have... Oh, grief, you're cutting out. No, this will non, I never grab vanillas. So it won't put a vanilla on a vanilla. It will always put a text on a vanilla unit, which is probably already in play, because there's no sign of the ability saying that the target that gets the text is in your deck. So it is probably only uh, so it's probably only target vanilla units in, on the board. So yep. the idea from Mystic isn't how bad. Um, Provisto, if you have the if it is ever hits itself in, a, in the deck, you're a little bit screwed. Mm -hmm. So getting stuff like Mom, getting um, dim, 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 dim. Dim, dim, dim. Uh, okay. Ethereum um, is not a bad call. Yeah, the thing is, uh, you don't want summon abilities. You just want passives and actives. Yeah. And um, all the cheap, um, uh, all the cheap vanillas that you have in your deck. In that case, you're not running any other cards except for good cards and vanillas. And at that point, do you really want to go to the extent of? putting the effects from cards in your deck on one little and not just reanimating them. No. Or playing a control deck. Or a soul point combo. Or, 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 uh, facil or facilitating uh, the strategy of those cards that are usually uh, played alongside them. 
and so on and so forth. How much of a payoff does this kite give you, especially looking at the stats for what it does? It's a, it's a four cost neutral kite with a tree tree stat line that if it ever grabs its elf from its own effect, you have a tree tree four cost with minus four vanilla stats. <laughs> Yeah, I think this can afford to have a vanilla stat line. Its effect is so high rolling, right? I think, well, another thing is, you'd probably want to play this in something like a water a dancer or, in which case, you'd do something like emergency glass, where you wouldn't have the vanilla units in your deck. You'd oh. have actions that spawn vanilla units. Or beggars, if that gets in, yeah. Yeah. And then okay. that way... You can spawn them in, and now you can add finishers to a 1-1, one, one, which has potential to be really strong. Maybe. Um, if you Unless can pull something off like uh, Gravenal and get that onto a 1-1 one, one before your opponent has time to respond, uh, respond. Um, you can start copying their units, gain tons of HP, have a substantial board and they have to respond to the one one while having to deal with their own units yeah i just think this needs a filter because it's the way it's worded sounds like it it pull it has a chance of pulling a text from a vanilla to a vanilla no cannot it says because, that in the blocks um you can filter stuff Okay, uh, the thing is, the text already specifies that it uh, pulls the text from a card, and textless cards are already, uh, it's already a capability of t uh, um, filtering out textless cards. I think it needs a reminder text. Because we have, we, no, because we have already cards that do similar stuff in the collection. Oh. Yeah. It's a little confusing, though. <laughs> I hope you can see, I think my confusion is reasonable. Uh. But anyways, okay. Let, let's talk about, about uh, mana ramp stuff. Effects we don't have enough of. I mean, sorry. Mana Meadow. Uh, three drop spirit. Zero three plant place from nowhere in particular. Um, I guess that's fine. Can't attack and plus two max mana. Mana main on steroids. Go. Grief. I wouldn't call it on steroids. Um... It's a three cards that cannot attack, which Mana Maiden can. Um, it dies to red version. Um, has only three HP, but gives you two mana. It's it's good as it's really good as a ramp card. But out of, but outside of that, it doesn't do anything else except for one little aspect. Re, uh, recheck the typing. Plant place. It's a plant. <laughs> So it uh, can grow with Torn Regent, it can be copied, it can be uh, reduced, etc. Um, it benefits from all the plant synergies, which is yep. really nice, and Dad loves such bullshit. <laughs> Snapdragon, make it a 5-5, five five, just so it's a bigger, beefier blocker. I think this could afford to have a little bit more HP for what it's worth. Um, just a smidge. I think 4 would be fine. I mean, it, as I said, it benefits already from all the HP buffs that Mind and uh, Spirit has, plus the plants. Uh, yeah, base. that's a good, so, yeah. a good point. Mystic, what do you think about this? I think it's a massive hit or miss card. If it stays on the board for even one turn, it's now effectively a one-cost unit, and you pretty much just floated two mana. Yeah. If your opponent removes it, then it's just kind of like, okay, I just lost a time bit of momentum. Um, but they probably got advantage. Also, with the mention of plant cards, regret for Chopper. You can now just get two of these. You now have eight mana on... No, nine mana on turn five. You play Veld Mother or Gravenal, and... You now have your finisher out like way before they have anything to deal with it. You can play Jonathan, uh, any pretty much anything on turn five 
this is doing too well. Uh, this is already doing pretty well, and I want it in the game, so I would quit talking about all the combos now. No. <laughs> no. First of all, by the way, Cornmeal, I really, really like uh, the art. This is the same guy who did Komodo Commando, the super dark one, and this is, like, a really, really pretty card. Like, we got this nice little wistful meadow, and I don't know. Do you have anything else to say, Mystic? I kind of interrupted you. <laughs> I personally, I don't like this card. I don't like mana. Okay. I don't like Perma. I don't like floating mana. Mana ramp is a really scary thing for me because I dislike it when my opponent just comes out with a finisher on like turn five and it's just like I guess I'm dead. There's nothing I can... I. It's just like I guess there's nothing I can do if I don't have a lot of removal. And I'm personally not one who likes to run a ton of removal. Yeah. So I don't want this in the game because if my opponent plays this, I'm not going to be able to remove it. It's just going to sit there giving them two extra mana each turn, which is absurd. But okay, so you, so you have this thing where threats, it, if you move up the power level of a threat, it moves up the power level of answers to meet it, ideally. And that, that's kind of how people want to see things. If people see big threats, they want to build things to counter them. And that creates more interactive gameplay. Now, some people like the lower power kind of stuff. But I know Grief and I are big fans of, of versatility. And Grief, more so than me, is a big fan of interactivity. So I think this pushes the game in an interesting direction, especially because Mana Ramp is not something we have a lot of. Uh, we have Blood Letter, which is like a one-off one thing. And we have, I think, uh, Mana Maiden's rotated, right? Uh, no, it's... Actually, still on Sanity, if I remember correctly, yeah. Dylan? Oh, how about that? I think Ramp has rotated out. Ram oh, the Ramp. The Ramp. That one's, that one's so funny. I don't know. I think it's interesting. And I, I, I'd be eager to see maybe a couple more effects like this, or maybe this get rebalanced, <gasps> or whatever. Spyro! I mean, baby purple dragon! <laughs> So one drop strength, three, three, dragon from nowhere in particular with can't attack, can't block, and active, pay one to give this plus one, plus one. Uh, if it has six or more attack and HP, it loses, can't attack and block, and gains flying. This isn't from Talera. Um, interesting. Oh, this is uh, Arkuj. So this is the, the new designer we were talking about. Um, do I want to invest this is a stocks game this is an investment game um and he does nothing in the meantime but he starts as a one drop three three so this also could possibly play into like i could find a means to silence him or i can find a means to i don't know something else um it's a very very cute art from bgg uh 1996 that has been on the art sheet for a while it would be interesting to maybe see it make it what do you think, Mystic? I think this card is slightly overpowered. And this is going to take a little explanation. Um, let's just yours. think about this for a moment. You have to pay four mana for a 6-6 six, six flyer. That's above curve. Your opponent, sure, they can see this coming. But even in the later game, if you're playing active synergy, um, and this con it just synergizes with active synergy with like gold mace, not 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 exactly, but you'd probably also be rolling Ellis. Now, what Ellis does, if I remember correctly, it readies a unit with an active when it enters play, um, and it makes their actives cost one less mana. So this is now just a one drop. 6-6 six, six flyer if you have Ellis in play. I think this is above curve. And even if you use something like Mesmerize on this, you're still a mana loss if you're yeah. using Mesmerize on this. Because ah. you just spent three yeah. mana. They spent one mana. Now they have a 3-1 on the board and you've just lost a lot of momentum while they've only lost a tiny bit. And I mean... 
I don't know. I think a lot of the ways that people might use this are something like tectonic plate mail and giving this uh, plus two, plus two, and plus two, plus two for each equipment you play after it, uh, which lets you just get that effect out quicker because you don't have to use the active to get it to the level it's at. You can do something else. And at that point, you're getting two for one. The other way, doing it the, the honest way, like you suggested, I have to invest... Actually, that's not even much of an investment for Perlma. I guess Perlma does have to probably lose their double in on turn one. Um, no, you're not playing this card on turn one, even in Perlma. <laughs> uh, or in Perlma, you're not even playing this card on turn one because it's so bad tempo. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, th I think the setup and the, the, what you have to go through is justified. Um, uh, I can kind of see some of what Mystic's saying. What do you think, Ruth? The thing is, you are... Okay. First of all, the active deck is really not existing. It's an active shell of KM. What the active deck has is and probably for the longest while until Sparky gets into the game, and even then, it's not really a thing, will never be good. Like, there's so much that has to be, uh, the stars have to align perfectly to for act for the so-called active deck to do some shit. <laughs> um, this doesn't help that deck in any slightest way, uh, in any shape or, uh, shape or form. It's an equipment card, as you already pointed out. You put tectonic, uh, tectonic plate mail on it and probably lightning rapier or blazing shurikens and get this to a seven, uh, to be, uh, be a seven, Mm -hmm. um, to be a seven, seven, whatever. But at that point, it's already you've already spent it. I uh, spent at least seven mana on it to be a seven, seven flyer. <laughs> so you have to work for it to actually be a thing. And let's be honest, we have uh, your, your opponent now will try to silence that thing unless it has actually effects on it. Um, it will probably um, be removed by a massive jouster, it, um, uh, Sally says a lot, can be chump blocked and it's silenced at that point because you're, uh, you're playing against a control deck. Hard removed, it's pretty bad as well because you've spent so many, uh, so many resources on this thing until it gets actually going instead of your vein reaver and so on and so forth. Coming back to the entire question of Am I paying three mana for three different turns to get this off the ground in Permo? No. Am I using it in uh, am, I, am I using it in Heldom as a turn one play? No, because I need my turn one play, which is probably friendship to get something that I can stop attacking. Mm -hmm. um, if this ever Gyros was large enough and eats a dark cold, well, sucks to be you. There are so many ways actually that deal with it and make it a really bad investment to the point where I ask myself, why do I play this instead of any other active ability card that does something or even a place? Because place can even block at that point. Yeah. This card cannot even block until you get it going with equipments or its active ability. Mm -hmm. So you think back to the drawing board with this one? Yeah, because as I said, because as I said, even if you're playing this Alice shell, you're already at turn five or six, and there is a lot of cards that are already active and online for your opponent mm -hmm. at that point. One more thing I would like to mention is okay. if you're running Twin Pike, which gives plus three attack, you can get this a six three flyer on turn two. No, you nope. cannot. HP has to be a, at, six, at, at 6 as well. 6 attack and 6 HP. Uh, Both thresholds. I missed that part. Yeah, I did too. I was reading it while you guys were talking. Um, <laughs> so I don't blame you. Um, so yeah, it, it does require something like tectonic plate mail, which is an investment. Um, I also kind of wish it lost that active on the way because that's going to gum up my board if I'm trying to give it duelist or something. It doesn't need that active once it's online. Uh, that's just a minor quibble, but it's worth talking about. So I think I'm going to stop the share. 
and we'll do some closing notes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for Mystic for joining us on such short notice. It was really nice having you here. Yeah, it thank was you. nice seeing some, persp uh, some perspective from like a newer player um, like me. You started about the same time I did. Yeah, I also know I have a lot of very controversial opinions. So it's okay. I wonder how, I wonder how this is going to turn out. It's no usually uh, uh, two uh, alpha players versus me, and now it's two jank players versus grief. <laughs> I enjoyed this episode because this is like an ASMR episode where we got like your silky smooth voice and grief silky smooth voice, and then I'm an air horn. Um, oh, damn. oh boy, we killed him. Uh, <laughs> so thank you again, Mystic. Uh, thank you again, as always, to my faithful co-host, Grief, for putting You're up welcome. with me. You're welcome. You're welcome, Timmy. For putting up with me. Uh, like, yeah. comment, and subscribe uh, for validation's sake. I do this for just for fun, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, keep on having fun and playing cards and uh, exercising your right to vote. Bye. See you. Bye.